You're here to hear about renewable energy and how it's going to increase your competitive advantage. My name is Miguel Gil Mast. As you can tell, not entirely Spanish, not entirely German. So if you want the German version of this presentation, I'll be doing it at one o'clock tomorrow, or English today or English Thursday. So tomorrow, probably at one o'clock, I'm not sure. But that's the, that's the goal. So I'm here today to talk to you about how to use renewable energy for the competitive advantage. I, hopefully you have some understanding of that it can be a competitive advantage in terms of marketing and sales, but it's the how that I really want to focus on. So hopefully by the end of this 10 minute talk, you have an idea of how can you get started, some of the different options you have and the pros and cons of those. The background of this is this urgency that we're all facing of climate change. So I think it's worth remembering that our trajectory of emissions, if we don't do anything, is bad for all of us and our kids and our grandkids. So even with very aggressive policies, it's not great. And so if we really want to keep it to not really bad, then we need to do a lot. And renewable energy is an important building block of reducing this emission pathway. So both personally, of course, but if you can influence in any way your companies to buy more renewable energy and reduce your impact, then you are participating in this vision, which hopefully we all want to have if we want our kids to live the same way that we've had the opportunity to live in. So a lot of things need to happen for this to work. Let's break it down into something manageable and focus on renewable energy uh, for today and specifically electricity. So as you can tell, a lot of companies are making big commitments on renewable energy. Yeah, you see a lot of logos here, including Schneider Electric's own logo, they will say things like, we're going to use more. They might sign up to one of these initiatives, the Science-Based Target Initiative, which tries to align that emission reduction with climate science, so be really robust. The RE100 initiative, which is things companies sign up for if they want to publicly proclaim, we're going to be 100% renewable by 2025 or 2030. It's a statement that you can make, it's a target you can set, and then your company knows that's the vision, and you work towards that. So a lot of big logos are doing that. And one thing which today's presentation is going to focus on because of that competitive advantage angle is that the science-based target initiative looks beyond their own operations or your own operations into the supply chain and decarbonizing that. And that can be a really interesting lever and if you happen to supply to any of these companies, that's coming for you. If you supply to Schneider Electric, you know it's coming for you, as we've already sent you messages about it. If you supply to others, they may be preparing for that or already initiating their own supply chain programs. So, a bunch of press about this. I think you've probably seen that. Hopefully that's why you're at this presentation. Just to level set a bit on what are we talking about when we talk about emissions, you can break them down into these different categories. Scope one, scope two, scope three, that gets thrown around a lot. Scope two is where renewable energy would sit if you are procuring it. But if you're a supplier to any company, then you are in their scope three. And the, the thing that's happening right now is the big companies have already done a lot in scope two. They're probably already powered 100% by renewables. They've probably focused a lot on efficiency and a cleaner form of generation on site to reduce the direct emissions. And they're now looking at scope three, which is really a gigantic elephant in the room. So just a reminder, scope one is essentially things that are generating smoke and burning and, and causing emissions physically on your premises. Scope two is indirect emissions, amongst others, caused by the electricity that's being delivered to you. And scope three is your supply chain and your upstream materials um, and downstream use of, of your products. When you look at those emissions then, usually what companies will try to do, if you say you've got a target to reduce your emissions, is to have a pathway to get to whatever that target is. So this is a, an example to give you an overview. It sets into context those different scopes we just covered. And so you'll be looking at, this is what we currently have, these emissions. I realize this, this laser pointer is not really working. I'm going to walk over here. You see here, these are your total baseline emissions. Hopefully you're planning to grow your business, which usually means you're growing your emissions. And then you've got these different levers of this waterfall that you can use to get to whatever it is your target are. So being efficient, just using less, being more effective with the resources that you use, switching to renewable energy. Energy can involve electricity as well as other forms of energy. For today, I'm going to be focusing more on electricity just to keep it really tangible. And then you've got credits and offsets which can be used you, depending on what you want to do and the messaging you want to have around that and then your supply chain. These will be different sizes for every business and that's something that you develop as you go towards these targets is 
what do I actually need to do? Today, we're going to be zooming in on renewable energy, which is often a really big one, and also has the potential to be a cost-effective way to make a really big step here. So cost-effective, a trend for today, for this discussion, um, because that helps you, going back to the business growth, sell more things if you bring down your costs, and this can help you do that and reduce at the same time. So let's just set some metaphor for electricity. I use a bunch of different analogies and metaphors for this, but let's say for today, renewable electricity is like water. What I mean by that is, when electricity is generated and put into the grid, it's very hard to know when you pull it out somewhere else, let's pretend that's a socket, where did that electricity actually come from? You get the electricity that happens to be delivered where you happen to sit, and somewhere else maybe there's electricity going into the grid which is clean, or it's dirty, or it's whatever shade and political color you want to give it. So, much like water, if you imagine you've got a big lake, there's streams going into it, some are dirty, some are clean, the water that you pull out is the water that you happen to get if you stood by that lake in that point of view. So it's very difficult with electricity to physically track these electrons are clean because I did something. So what happens is you have to have an accounting system that says, let's count how much clean water goes into the lake, and then let's only allow companies to take out as much clean water as is mathematically actually available, because we've counted it when it went in. After that, it all gets mixed, and you've got whatever water that lake's color is. So pulling it out, you need to be able to track that, and it has to be prevent any kind of double counting or greenwashing by doing that. So that's a fundamental building block of renewable electricity, is that in order to verifiably and to a high standard claim that you're consuming renewable electricity, it needs to have gone through that counting process to say it is officially in the pool that you're allowed to access. And then there's a process by which you delete it from that pool, and that needs to happen in order for these claims to be real. It's a bit intangible, but that's really the essence of it, is that there's no way otherwise to do that unless you are physically putting a PV panel next to your factories, which isn't going to cover most of it. But I'll get to that in a second. So let's break it down into sort of three buckets of how do you make those streams of water go into the lake? How can you make renewable electricity be generated in a way which you can claim it? You break it into, this is essentially the counting mechanism. This is the currency, if we want to switch to another analogy, of renewable energy. Energy attribute certificates in Europe called guarantees of origin. Usually in the UK, it's Rego. It's a REC in the United States. They're different types of certificates which count that flow. So they go in, one gets generated, and then you can claim that one and irreversibly cut it apart, and that's what allows you to claim it. So this is the currency of renewable energy, and you can just buy that currency and delete it and retire it out of that mm, lake in the metaphor. The other forms of buying renewables are a way that you generate this currency. So you can buy this, or you can put your own PV plant on your roof, it will generate renewable electricity. You can either consume it immediately or and consume it and have some of it go into the grid, which then it needs to have the certificate to make that counting system work. And then if you're getting it back at a later point in time, that certificate is what allows you to claim it. Because worst case scenario, what would, would happen otherwise is you could generate a bunch of electricity, it goes into the grid, someone else is saying that's mine because they got all the certificates, and you are saying it's mine as well because it's on my roof. That's what you want to avoid. That will definitely not give you a competitive advantage if you've done it that way. So you need to be careful with it. But that is a really tangible way that you can buy renewable electricity. It can have a return on investment, which is attractive. Now, with the energy markets as they are, it's gotten more attractive, and that can help. The challenge that you have with that one is usually scale. So you may have only 10% of your consumption that you can actually cover with this because you've got a limited amount of square meters to actually generate renewable electricity. The other one, then, is off-site generation which, for all intents and purposes, you're contracting with a utility-scale wind or solar farm. So if you're driving up and down the Autobahn and you see a big wind farm or a big solar park, that's the type of scale that you would be contracting with for this off-site generation, typically. And that's one which I'll get into a bit more detail because this one can be really cost-effective. One of the ways you can also buy off-site renewable energy is just by calling your supplier and saying, hey, can you put me on a green tariff or a green version of this supply contract. That's possible. You need to be careful with the currency again. And it's usually not very cost-effective compared to some of the other options, but it's, it's possible. 
if you do get into something which is called a PPA, which probably maybe you've heard about, a lot of companies write about it, this power purchase agreement, what you're essentially doing in exchange for the commitment to provide some kind of guarantee to a wind farm which hasn't yet been built, you get cost-effective renewable energy when it does get built. So your guarantee allows that project developer to go to a bank and say, I can get this project financed because if I build it, I've got this off-taker who is going to guarantee me the revenue stream. The bank says, fantastic, I love the sound of that. Here's the money, go and buy all the wind turbines, build that thing. Once it's built, you as the buyer access cost-effective renewable energy because you made that project get built in the first place. So there's two things that does. One is the project wouldn't have existed without your commitment which is a really powerful messaging when you go back to those big brands, if you're supplying to those big brands and you've managed to do that, they value that as opposed to passive forms of buying renewable energy, which it aren't, don't have the same high impact that is needed for the energy transition. And this can be really attractive and cost effective depending on where you are in the world. Um, this can give you significant savings compared to traditional energy. So reducing costs and high visual impact um, just keeping an eye on time here, um, to market yourself better compared to your, um, yourself before and your competitors. They may only manage to do this or this because these are less complicated. So if you can manage this, you can differentiate yourself, reduce costs and have that more effective messaging in a really tangible way. Some examples of companies that are differentiating themselves by reducing their emissions that we've worked with are here. There's many more if you supply to any pharmaceutical company, a Novartis, an AstraZeneca, what have you, you will be in a supply chain which is saying you must all make everything you supply to me with renewable energy. If you're supplying to Apple, the same thing will be happening to you. If you're supplying to a Volvo or other automotive companies, the same thing is happening. They're all demanding that you buy renewable energy. So then the way to differentiate is Everyone must buy renewables, so the how you do it is how you differentiate yourselves against all the other suppliers and hopefully win a contract that you wouldn't have won if you hadn't been doing that more effectively. I hope that was a good introduction to renewables and the how of how you can differentiate against this. This is often a little challenging, a little abstract, so if you've got any questions, I'm here all day. And as you remember, morgen gibt's das Ganze auf Deutsch. And on Thursday, we'll do it again in English. If you've got any clarifications and you want to check for my consistency as I go through this presentation, that's your chance. So thank you for being here and enjoy the rest of the fair. <laughs>